All right, everybody, so in today's video, we made $100 in the morning commute in the Sarasota area. We picked up a customer here in Palmetto, a nice suburban kind of cookie cutter looking community, and they were going quite a ways, all the way towards South Sarasota. Now this trip paid us $36 because it came with an almost $9 tip. That was very generous. Now the Palmetto area is kind of a sketchy area, but they're starting to put some nice suburban communities on the outskirts. I usually avoid rides from Palmetto because, well, you have to deal with people from Palmetto. I've been kind of hesitant with taking rides out of Palmetto because, well, they simply don't tip. I'm already starting to figure out the types of neighborhoods and areas where people are just using the service and they do not care to tip. And well, I'm avoiding those areas, but in this case, somehow it worked out pretty good. The person was going to Sarasota. Now, as you can see, from Palmetto to Sarasota in the morning rush hour, southbound is absolutely horrendous. Now, as bad as this looks, this is what Interstate 75 looks like almost every single morning. But as I drove further down the road, it actually cleared up a little bit and it wasn't as bad as I expected. Now, the morning rush hour commute, you can make about 100 bucks, let's say in four hours. There's usually good morning commute like it's, it's not like a bad run to make it's actually pretty good but you have to understand it's possibly one of the most congested and hectic times to be on the road so you want to go with people that are going to consider you and tip you as much as possible to make the effort worthwhile but again the person gave me a nearly nine dollar tip so we're on interstate 75 right here we just passed the bridge on 44th which will connect lakewood ranch to the city of bradenton more effectively i can't wait till they finish that we're driving now into Sarasota, so for the most part, Interstate 75, like I said, is an absolute nightmare. We get off on Bee Ridge Road. Because it's a 40-minute drive, we made some small talk about traffic and construction projects. Very minimal just to cut the tension so that it wasn't awkward because, again, you're sitting in a car with this person for nearly an hour, 20 minutes to drive there. So this whole thing took about an hour, but just do the math. An hour of driving for $36 isn't bad. Try finding a job in Florida that will pay you $36 an hour, but the person was only in the vehicle for 41 minutes, so that's not bad at all. That's almost 40 some dollars an hour. That's actually really sweet. So the next pickup that I had was at a dealership right here. And again, we have to respect people's privacy. And this is something, it's part of the Uber policy agreement therefore we cannot show you exactly where i'm taking everything i can't really disclose a person's information but i can give you guys a general idea of course a dealership is a very big place so i can tell you guys that i pick something or someone up from a dealership that really doesn't take away anybody's privacy so we go to this mercedes-benz dealership and we're going from one mercedes-benz dealership to another smaller dealership or car related place and this trip actually came with an $8 tip. So this morning, people were tipping me for being out there in the rush hour, and that brought the trip total to $29, which isn't bad because I completed it in 45 minutes. So one came with an $8 tip, the other came with an $8.78 tip, so nearly $9. But what's interesting is that the one that paid less actually took a lot longer and it was a lot longer mileage so you can see that there is discrepancy between trips where you could actually pick up one trip where you make let's say nine dollars more an hour or in 45 minutes which would count about twelve dollars more an hour which is significantly so you do have to be very selective about which trips you take now both of these trips were great because this one made me 28 and the one before made me 36 you can't beat that because we're talking in an hour and a half I made just over $60. And here's what I want you guys to know. You guys have been saying, I'm using this giant pickup truck. Isn't your gas mileage more? We'll get to that in a minute. So while I'm driving down Bradenton, look at this person's neighborhood. They have, look, these are all mango trees, by the way. Everything on the left, those are all giant mango trees. There's one thing beautiful about West Bradenton is that the mango trees here are just some of the largest I've seen anywhere in Florida. It's an old city next to the water. It takes $63 to fill up my gas tank and we've already made $60. So we can say by looking at my gas gauge that I still have completely a full gas tank left to make hundreds more dollars 
before I actually have to fill up again. So if you go back to that gas gauge, that is how much gas we've consumed to pay off the gas tank. So almost insignificant. And this is what I'm trying to tell you guys. You guys are like, you're Ubering out of this giant pickup truck. The gas mileage must be horrible. Yes, 15 miles per gallon is horrible, but the gas expense is an insignificant fraction of what we're doing here. I'm giving my passengers a giant pickup truck and most of my customers are going to be in rich areas gated communities going to the airport picking them up from the beach they may actually tip you more if they're comfortable nice and a brand new vehicle than they are if you're in some tiny little crossover where their knees are touching the back of the seat and it smells like somebody's dog people tell me that they're tipping me extra because they feel that the vehicle i'm providing makes a difference in their ride experience now that's not the case in lower income neighborhoods but if you're picking up somebody from the airport and they're going from the airport in sarasota to a resort on the beach that costs six hundred dollars a night they may tip you seven or eight dollars well seven or eight dollars can amount to almost 40 percent of the volume of the whole fare which means that i'm really making a huge increase on what i'm making on these trips which offsets the fuel expense of the larger vehicle a lot of people just don't understand that because they're counting pennies but sometimes when you're counting pennies you lose dollars so our passenger from west branton was going to the sarasota airport we dropped them off at the airport and they did not tip so far they haven't tipped they became awkward by my presence now i don't know what the crap i did because sometimes i'll look at a setting and say this is not a talker i won't say a single word i'll say welcome to my vehicle let's get your destination and that is it i'll play music very low volume music and usually you know i expect that in the morning commute if you don't talk to the person they will tip you generously because they're thinking about their day. They're going to get on an airplane where they're going. They don't want to talk to you. Maybe like at night, later in the evening, people are more talkative. But in the morning commute, don't say a word. People are just, they're in their own world. For some reason, I just don't understand. This customer was creeped out and they didn't tip me. And I could feel the negative vibe. Interesting, considering that I didn't interact with them at all. I mean, there was more than one passenger. They could have talked to each other. They didn't need my presence I, if there's two people there, if they want to talk, they can talk to each other. I mean, if it's one person, it's different. But if you've got two people in the back seat, they can talk to each other. They don't need me to talk to them. For some reason, again, I don't understand. They were just creeped out the whole ride. Not sure why. But they didn't even tip either way. So what the crap? Not getting tipped for an airport ride, not going to lie, somewhat aggravating. Possibly they didn't like my choice in music. Maybe I could experiment going out today with people and playing music that I definitely think they will not like at a very low volume and see if I go through the entire day without getting tips. But I just thought, hey, I'm being myself. I'm listening to what I want to listen to. I'm completely ignoring your presence. At the end of the day, you're getting on an airplane. You've got things to do. So what the crap do you need my input? Apparently, I don't know what I did wrong with these people, but they didn't tip me and I could definitely tell they were creeped out. Now, Another nice thing about the big giant pickup truck is that for the most part, when people see a big, luxurious, nice vehicle, they assume you're not a mess up. Now, if you pull up in some little sheep car, people are always skeptical, skeptical about getting into an Uber because it looks kind of, it's a, you know, it's a weird transaction. You're getting into a car with a stranger. I do feel like my truck puts people at ease. It's an expression of personality it's freaking red and bright and giant it's a comfortable vehicle most likely they're assuming you're not just ubering full times they always know you got something else going on in your life which makes them feel that you're not just some desperate uber driver you're not just some npc in a honda you're like a person in a big giant pickup truck you're somebody you know and i think that to a large degree does influence how the person's initial reception the initial reception with me is usually pretty good it's like hey wow i get to ride this big awesome pickup truck i even had a lady who called me a redneck she's like you stupid rednecks are always jacking up your trucks and now i gotta climb on in here with my back i was like lady if that ain't the kettle calling the cat black you're calling me a redneck but regardless it does for the most part exception being this one redneck lady who was like you're a dang redneck jacking this whole truck up now i gotta climb up in here but i do feel like it makes a good reception it's a great conversation piece as well how are you driving a uh yeah 
$80,000 looking truck. You know, it's, it's an expensive truck. It's, uh, it's not cheap. So there you go. If you do not mind awkwardly long periods of silence in the morning commute, is definitely the way to go. There is the weird exception like this person who for some reason was upset or creeped out by me for some reason that I absolutely do not understand or know why. But at the end of the day, most morning commuters do not want to talk. So I guess my biggest tip to you is if you're doing the morning commute, is people got things on their mind, plans for their day, and the last thing they care about is a freaking Uber driver's opinion about it. The morning commute is pretty hectic and pretty much frustrating, but there is good money to be made. I think you could easily make $100 in four hours during the morning commute in the Sarasota area. My aim is to offer the customer something more by the vehicle that I'm bringing, by the fact I'm not creeping them the crap out, and by the fact sometimes I'll play music that I think caters to the person's like, and that kind of helps, you know, make the trip more enjoyable for the person. It's not just getting into this vehicle with a complete stranger. It's like, whoa, this thing is freaking nice, bro. You got red leather seats up in here, good music, nice air conditioner. It's a comfortable, enjoyable experience for the passenger. And I think that makes it worthwhile for them. So they tip. Now I calculate that if you're making over a dollar a mile, let's say a dollar twelve, a dollar thirteen. Well, that thirteen is the fuel, so let's call it a dollar a mile. 100,000 miles, if I were just to Uber endlessly for the rest of the year, for like a year straight, let's say I just did it like seven days a week, and I managed to rack up 100,000 miles a year, which a lot of Uber drivers do that, in theory, I could pay off my $63,000 pickup truck in nine months. That's freaking incredible. Even if they'll have 70,000 miles on it, the fact that I could pay off this brand new luxury vehicle in less than a year considerably less than a year yeah dude it's absolutely worth it people are like you're just throwing your vehicle your price appreciation okay so i don't know if you guys understand this the price depreciation on mileage on a larger vehicle like a toyota camry a small camry like that with a hundred thousand miles depreciates but now the overall value left over is insignificant because it's not an expensive vehicle. An expensive vehicle is going to depreciate either way. So there's not much of a price difference between a 20,000 mile pickup truck and an 80,000 mile pickup truck if it's new. You're talking a few thousand, a few thousand. Like we're talking like a six, four thousand dollar difference, but you're talking about 63,000 miles at a dollar per mile. That's a huge difference. That's 10 times more than the appreciation. So Yes, the vehicle is depreciating rapidly. Yes, we're racking up these miles, but there's still a 2023 GMC Sierra left over. I mean, if I was just to drive this truck aimlessly, endlessly, and I were to rack up 65,000 miles, my vehicle would be paid off in nine months, a $63,000 vehicle. Forget about the fuel because you're making a little bit more than a dollar a mile. Not sure if you know this, but you still have to have a vehicle in America, and every vehicle still has insurance, still has gas, still has maintenance, so it's not like those costs are deferred back to zero if you don't have a Uber driving experience because you still have to have a vehicle. There's still an overhead involved. You're just cutting that overhead significantly. Depreciating vehicles has been kind of my talent through life, it's a great tax write-off as well. So to the people that tell me that it definitely is not worth to Uber out of my vehicle because it's depreciating because it's a very expensive vehicle. Again, if I were just to Uber endlessly, I could pay off this vehicle in about nine months. In nine months, I would still have a $40,000 pickup paid off. Plus the time I used it, it doesn't really seem like a bad trade-off. But if you were to do the same thing with a Camry, the Camry wouldn't be worth $40,000. It wasn't worth $40,000 brand new. So the long-term inherent value of a more luxurious vehicle that appreciates less isn't really a bad trade-off. And I think a lot of you guys that are saying, blah, 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 you haven't really done the math behind it. It doesn't seem like it works out, but I'm looking at it now and it does seem to make sense. At the end of the day, a brand new pickup truck, a luxurious pickup truck of 100,000 miles, Somebody will still pay thirty, forty thousand dollars for it. The Camry wasn't worth that new. And in the meantime, here I am driving around this really cool truck versus 
driving around in a Camry where your back is going to hurt. If I were to drive endlessly in a Camry for six months, I'd need a wheelchair by the time I was done because it's a small, uncomfortable vehicle. This is a big, luxurious vehicle. It's comfortable for me. It's comfortable for the passengers. And overall, we're all having a better experience. So if there's a better option, why would you stick with an option that at face value looks more productive, but in the long term, it doesn't create any inherent value. It depreciates just as much. How can it depreciate more than what it's worth? So there's always the comments of, oh, you're stupid. This doesn't make sense. You're never going to make your money's worth. But that's somebody who really couldn't. I've been on both ends of that deal. I've had a Camry. I've had a pickup truck. I think I understand what I'm doing here. Remember, I got out of the Camry when I got into the pickup truck. I bought the Camry for $32,000, put 56,000 miles on it. And in that time period, it depreciated down to $15,000. And it did break on me. It's not like the Camry didn't break on me. It did have a repair that left me stranded about eight hours from home. A $15,000 in depreciation is half the vehicle's value. Hello, this pickup truck's not going to depreciate $30,000 if I put 50,000 miles on it. You understand what I'm saying? If I were to trade it out before I got to the point where the trade-off of the you know mileage did make a difference, then at that point it would be a loss. But if I were to trade the vehicle out before the mileage really became a considerable factor, then the depreciation is insignificant. In other words, it literally costs the same to drive a $60,000 vehicle as it does to cost a $30,000 vehicle because the depreciation on a pickup truck is actually better than the depreciation on a Camry, whether you believe it or not. Because people think Toyota has infinite, you know, all oh, the Toyotas don't depreciate, dude. My camera was a $32,000 purchase with 15,000 miles on it, and it was sold for $15,000, so 56,000 miles. Guys, that is horrendous depreciation. Uh, don't think the pickup truck will depreciate that much, and that's the thing that people just don't understand about depreciation. But anyways, just because you don't understand the math behind it doesn't mean it doesn't work. It does seem like it's going to work. Is it like a cash cow? No, but it's, it's a thing you can do on the side. Sometimes stingy people will make their own lives inconvenient, thinking they're saving money, don't realizing that sometimes being stingy costs more money than being, well, a big time player like me. But you don't know that because you were listening to Dave Ramsey on your way home.